Welcome to the latest in this a series of LRB readings podcasts about British and American poetry, drawing on the rich archive of essays and reviews and memoirs of poets that have appeared over the years in the London Review of Books. My name is Seamus Perry. I teach English at the University of Oxford, and I'm talking to Mark Ford, a poet, critic, and a professor of English at University College London. And our subject today is the great American poet Robert Lowell, whose most famous collection, Life Studies, appeared 60 years ago and was one of those books which seemed to change everything. So, Mark, before we get to Life Studies, we need to go back to the beginning of Lowell's life. And I suppose of, of all the poets that we've talked about, Lowell is the one who, who most calls for a biographical approach. Yes, um, the, the, the sort of change in poetry that Life Studies initiated um, went by the rather unfortunate name of confessional poetry. Um, that should always be in inverted commas. But the idea was that the poet would make use of instances, uh, um, often traumatic episodes from his or her life, and that would become uh, the sort of subject matter of the poetry in a way that it, it hadn't done before Life Studies, that no previous poetry had foregrounded to the same extent as poets such as uh, Sylvia Plath, Anne Sexton, John Berryman uh, and Robert Lowell himself, the particular incidents from their own history. So inevitably, if you kind of engage with Lowell's poetry at all, you become interested in his life. And there's a sort of striking thing about his life in that he was a Lowell. And perhaps in England, uh, English readers aren't quite aware of the kind of uh, what it meant to be a Lowell, the kind of kudos, the aristocratic prestige, the sense of having belonging to families on both sides, both mother and father, that drive back to the 17th century settlers uh, in New England. Uh, so that to be a Lowell was to carry a very significant cultural and uh, political weight. Uh, and that's something which I, it, it is really present in Lowell's poetry that he the only equivalent I guess we have in England would be someone like Byron, uh, Lord Byron um, again was a kind of popular sensation but something similar is operative in the ways in which Lowell's poetry was kind of received. So we're talking about Boston aristocracy, Boston, New England and particularly Harvard sort of aristocracy aren't we? Yes uh, I mean obviously Henry James had come out of that particular, uh, to some extent out of that particular milieu and William James uh, and Emerson and Thoreau I think you can't consider Lowell too much apart from his New England heritage, um, both in terms of the puritanical aspect, uh, the extent to which his poetry is one racked by um, self-consciousness and conscience and a kind of rigorous examination of his own behaviour uh, and a dramatisation of his own behaviour that becomes, or, or did become for many Americans, exemplary, particularly of kind of Cold War anxieties and paranoias that Lowell, t to a, a great extent, emerged in the 50s and 60s as someone who was experiencing the full weight of American schizophrenia, expectation, madness, violence, all the the terms that we associate with Lowell that are sort of part of what his poetry describes somehow also uh, represent a, a sort of crisis in the American body politic. So something that which in perhaps more normal circumstances might seem quite unusual or peripheral experience becomes in Lowell's hands exemplary that, of, that's of the nation's experience. Absolutely right. Yeah. I think it was John Ashbery who won, who was not a Lowell fan at all wondered, you know, why people were interested in the in the, the rather unhappy circumstances. Uh, and if Lowell had been an ordinary Joe, would people have been that interested? Uh, but people were interested from the beginning and they were interested initially because of the name, but but after life studies, they were interested because Lowell had invented a new way of write, of life writing, of writing about the self, life studies, uh, which was it was an invention. It was it was obviously built on uh, his readings of Pound and Eliot and Frost. I and mean, he was enormously well read um, and a, a kind of devoted scholar of European uh, and or, poetry in many languages, uh, and he translated a great deal of it, um, and of history as well, of characters like Caligula. Mm. Uh, he took his, na his nickname from Caligula, Cal, uh, pro perhaps not a good sign, uh, Napoleon as well, and that all, all of the, the things that Lowell describes in his poetry become somehow expressive of the Lowellian uh, and what it meant to be a Lowell and this particular Lowell. In his piece in the London Review of Books about uh, Lowell, published perhaps maybe 20 years ago now, John Bailey says, 
uh, that uh, the, the the fact of being a Lowell was was what made the kind of poetry he wrote possible in the first place, uh, being part of that kind of dynastic inheritance. And I think we we both agree with that. The way that Lowell portrays his own childhood, though, is is slightly different, isn't it? He's he's certainly conscious that he's part of this immense dynasty, which is part of the of the founding institutions of America and, and, and so on. But there's also an extremely small nuclear family that he's part of, isn't it? There's his mum, Charlotte Winslow Lowell. There's his dad, Robert Trail Spence Lowell III. And there's him. And, and, and he's the only child. So there's this odd sort of doubleness about being a Lowell, isn't there, where you're a once part of an immense um, aristocratic uh, dynasty, but you're also part of an extremely small and basically dysfunctional nuclear family. Uh, yes, his mother was extremely difficult and uh, his father, as Lowell presents him, was a kind of rather ineffectual and weak-minded man and Lowell felt that his childhood had traumatised him in many ways and he writes absolutely brilliantly about it in uh, 91 Revere Street, the, the long prose piece that's the sort of central section of life studies um, and anatomizes it in in uh, hilarious as well as kind of very copious detail and it is one of the most engrossing pieces of uh, of writing uh, I think that the 20th century produced um, I, I love it I've read it many many times and I never tire of the kind of ramifications and the details and the the perfect weight and balance with which he recreates this childhood but the, the overall sort of thesis that he presents in, in that is that, that the Lowells are decaying uh, and that's very much there's a, a sense in which it's all downhill yeah. for the Lowells yeah. and that they are kind of sad uh, diminished inheritors of what was a idealistic or kind of fantastically self-confident or powerful clan and all that's left are these rather kind of shrill, hysterical uh, defeated characters who are doing the best they can. Well to an extent, that is a way of, of dramatising his own sense of selfhood in a very kind of forceful and, and memorable way. But the actual diagnosis is one of, uh, and you get it throughout Lowell, is one of decay, of loss, and a general entropic descent towards some kind of l- loss of potency. Yes, what he calls in that, in that uh, wonderful memoir, My Father's Downhill Progress as a Civilian and Bostonian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a sort of double, double decline. Um, it's a lovely piece of writing, and in, in the uh, the piece that Michael Hoffman writes about Lowell for the London Review of Books, which is a terrific piece, as you would expect, because Hoffman's own poetry has been so influenced by Lowell's poetry. He writes very interestingly about the way that a lot of what makes Lowell's writing so good is his choice of adjectives, which sounds an extraordinarily kind of banal thing to say. Uh, but it's tr- I think it's true, don't you? And, and, and some of the descriptions in the, in the, in the prose account uh, are, are wonderful. His father, for example, he says, he, he's talking about his manners as a, as a driver of cars. He says he drove with flawless, almost instrumental monotony. <laughs> There's a kind of comedy about it, which will come back in life studies, isn't there? Yes, and I think that th- th- those word choices, uh, particularly in 91 Revere Street, reveal his debt to, to a writer like Flaubert, this uh-huh. sense of getting the mot juste, the exact word, that you do get in Lowell a, a kind of deadly precision, in particularly in his use of adjectives, and they're thought through and they're carefully selected and they carry a tremendous weight. I mean, famous ones from memory of West Street and Lepke, hairy, muscular, suburban, um, or flabby, bald, lobotomized. But that style, we should remember, came to Lowell only after a really severe and arduous and uh, flailing apprenticeship. Although he became very famous uh, and his first volume won the Pulitzer Prize in 1947, uh, Lord Weary's Castle, probably mainly because of the Lowell name rather than the poems, because personally I find most of Lowell up to the breakthrough of life studies pretty hard going. Is that your experience? Yes, I guess that's true. Let, well, let's say a little bit about how he gets there. So 1935, as almost would be expected, or as I suppose would be certainly expected, he enrolls at Har- Harvard. Um, he's having a very f- fractious and, and conflictual time with his parents, especially his father at this time. And in 1937, he does a, what must have been for a Lowell a big thing, which is to leave Harvard altogether. He heads south to Tennessee because he wants to as it were, express a a new relationship with his writing, Uh, not with New England, but with somewhere else. He wants to sign up to John Crow Ransom and and, and Alan Tate. 
Uh, and then shortly afterwards, he enrolls at Kenyon College. So he leaves Harvard for Kenyon College, which is a college in Ohio, liberal arts college, where Ransom and Tate uh, are now teaching. Now, can you give us some sense of what that move from, as it were, Lowellian, traditionally Lowellian Harvard, New England to the South, what that, what that means in terms of the of the literary politics, if you will, of American poetry at that time? Well, they were associated with a movement called the Agrarian Movement, which um, was uh, a Southern movement, uh, I should say a white Southern movement. It wasn't entirely removed from uh, notions of celebrating the Confederacy. Uh, It was against the industrialization of the South. And I think it expresses, as so many of of Lowell's choices and poetry expresses a kind of crisis, that his poetry is a poetry that feeds on crisis um, and abandoning Boston and all that it meant and the identity that it, that it offered him for this new break. I mean, he admired Ransom's poetry a great deal and that of Tate and a poem like Ode to the Confederate Dead by Tate was kind of a crucial poem for Lowell. But I think it, it also signalled an escape from all the New England expectations and also the weight of Modernism. I mean, the first letters in the collected letters were written to Ezra Pound, and he writes to Ezra Pound this extraordinary letter. He writes to Pound in Rapallo saying, can I come and be your disciple? Uh, I want to follow you and you'll find me, um, you know, he says that you'll find me quite normal, uh, having said some completely un- unnormal things. <laughs> so, and Pound slightly rebuffed him at that point. But his ambition was in no doubt that he wanted to be a great poet and he was prepared also to learn. He was in quest of mentors at this time. So having failed to kind of hook up with Pound, so to speak, uh, he set off south. And Ransom Tate were poets who had absorbed modernism, but were trying to write a poetry in the kind of wake of modernism. Thanks for listening to this extract from series one of Modernish Poets. To listen to the full series and to all our other close reading series, Sign up at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link below.